I usually got up at dawn or soon afterwards on this journey, except when I struck lucky by staying with someone or in circumstances of unusual comfort, but not always. Occasionally I would lie in bed on squalid pallets, reading till noon, and once all day until dinner time. Not that there was anything to complain of in my quarters in the little town of Baritza, where I had taken a room for the night in a sort of loft above a wheelwright's. Looking through the trap door and down a ladder almost beside my bed, I could see the bald patch on the crown of the wheelwright's head. As ankle deep in shavings and surrounded by a disorder of herbs, spokes, fellows, and swingle trees, he hammered and planed or sawed his way through planks with a square and biblical looking saw in which the blade was strung with thongs between a square wooden frame. Or chipped and sliced at a block with a hammer-backed adze, or thumped with a mallet. All his tools had a look of Nazarene antiquity. The sunbeams falling across the scattered gear danced with sawdust. And the smell of the freshly sawn wood floated up the steps, a scent only bettered by a baker's shop when they are shoveling the loaves out of the oven. Hoofs and wheels clattered and creaked over the cobbles under my window, and beyond them, a chorus of frogs. But these impressions only penetrated intermittently. I was halfway through the Brothers Karamazov, which I had started the evening before and read all through the night, my first introduction to Dostoevsky in a French yellow-back translation by Le Comte Prozor. Helplessly spellbound, I postponed getting up from half hour to half hour, in spite of the bright autumn morning outside. But at about 11 o'clock, the light lost its brilliance on the page. Clouds had collected, and soon the sky dissolved. A steady downpour started. This lets me off, I thought with delight, settling down more comfortably to the doings of Alyosha, and only descending the staircase at two. Rather shamefaced to seem so idle a lodger. I sat on in an eating house all the afternoon, brushing away the lazy autumn flies that loitered across the print only dimly aware of the steady pattern of the rain, interrupted every now and then by the friendly bewilderment of the owner, who sat swishing the flies from his brow at the other window. You read a lot, he would observe hourly. No go, much. Da, I answered faultlessly. The only other people there between meals were two frowning policemen who sat for an hour at the next table in silence with their rifles between their knees, fixing me with an unsettling scrutiny. My heart sank. At last, one got up, saluted, and asked me politely if I could spare two of those English cigarettes I had been smoking for him and his pal. I bestowed several on them with relief. I had recklessly bought two packets of players' navy cut in Ternovo. I had thought the police might have been tipped off by someone in Ternovo to dog my footsteps, having heard Vasil's suspicions about my being a spion at umpteenth hand. The book carried me all through supper until closing time and by candlelight until half past three in the morning. Dostoevsky ever since, and even the mention of his name, evokes a momentary impression of rain and fresh sawn wood.